God bless everyone tonight. Uh, we are grateful to be in God's presence. We are grateful uh, to see the glorious handiwork of another day. The psalmist said, this is the day that the Lord has made. And even though the psalmist was referring uh, to a victory that God had wrought, uh, for that particular time, historically, for that group of people, the theological beauty of such a statement is so excellent. So we say, this is the day that the Lord has made. Why? Because only God can make a day. And the very fact that our hearts are still beating means that God is not through with us. And I love to assert and declare and say and proclaim and preach and teach and tell it and testify that in the midst of trial and tribulation, in the midst of turbulence and turmoil, in the midst of death and destruction, in the midst of disease and famine, in the midst of political, social, economic and uh, uh, chaos and racism and classism and sexism and the list goes on, God is still God. And when we say that God is in control, uh, we don't mean that God is, is um, conforming to the actions of every individual that functions on our planet. But when we say that God is in control, we mean God is ultimately in, in charge, which means God has the first word and the last word of every matter in every way, form, or fashion. That's why we can trust him. And so my beloved brothers and sisters and students of the most high God, we are beginning tonight a series. This will definitely be a series of lessons, a series of exhortations, a series of classes. Uh, we're gonna label it all of that, a series of, of teaching, preaching, the communication of the word of God. And we're gonna call this knowing God knowing God. Um, it is the most profound journey that any, anyone can embark upon. Uh, this will be, this is going to be exciting. It will be a scriptural journey. The subject matter is I deal with, I like to call it a scriptural journey because the words of God have much more to say than I do. And this is why I like to give a lot of scripture when I teach because it is the word of God that God has obligated himself or God has obligated God's self to confirm, to confirm with signs following. Uh, all of us have opinions uh, of, of, of things, even when it comes to certain uh, doctrines or ideas or concepts. And that's okay because God gives us our individual, individual minds and thought patterns. We come from different persuasions, different uh, levels of study and understanding different levels of spiritual growth. But I want you to know, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. This, this, this is one of the reasons why it's powerful to pray the word of God or to pray the promises of God. God Almighty said, I exalt my word above my name. Why would God exalt his word above his name or his Hashem? The word in Hebrew literally means reputation. The idea is God has a good track record for keeping his word. That's good. God has a good track record for keeping his word. A person or an individual or a company or group that has a good name, it means that you can depend upon what they say. Now, as human beings, we are, we are fallible, so we're not perfect. And sometimes things may not turn out the way we plan or the way we intended. But when God speaks a word, when God promises something, it is as good as done because God and his word are one. So we are going to have a series of lessons with different titles talk, uh, called uh, uh, talking about knowing God, knowing God. And we're going to use his word. Of course, uh, the word will be a foundation, of course, of all that we we'll discuss with regard to knowing God, but we're gonna know God, we're gonna learn about knowing God through his word. We're gonna, especially the Psalms, because I'm telling you, I could live in the Psalms for the rest of my life. 
because so many of the Psalms deal with God's attributes, his characteristics, uh, his mighty acts. And that's what we're going to, that's what we're going to do. We're going to deal with God or about knowing God through his word, especially the Psalms. We're going to learn about knowing God through his works, through his miracles, through his acts. Uh, many of the prophets and the psalmists and the kings and the priests talked about the mighty acts of God. We're going to learn about knowing God. We're going to uh, know God or learn the idea or the rubric or the category of knowing God through his ways, through his names, again, through his attributes, through the Godhead. And when the, the scripture in the New Testament speaks of the Godhead, it speaks of his deity or his godness, the fact that God is God. We'll know him through the Father. We'll know him through the Son. We'll learn of him through the Holy Spirit. And so we are going to begin. Tonight, I want to call this class, and let me say uh, before we continue, <laughs> to know God absolutely. And I'm going to try to take my time. I know I have the tendency to talk real fast, but I'm going to, sometimes it's just going to come out that way especially when it gets good to me. But I'll try to repeat things because this is, this is really an important subject, but it's going to be quite exciting. And I said, as I said, it's going to be adventurous. But to know God absolutely is an impossible task. Notice how I said that. To know God absolutely is an impossible task. The journey that we are about to embark upon, knowing God, is an eternal journey. Well, that's beautiful. Because if we could know God absolutely, then God would not be absolute. God is the most perfect being. So there's no way to know him absolutely because uh, he is eternal. So we will always, we will always be in a state or the condition of learning more and more about God, which makes, makes this exciting. So we may have learned verses in church school, we may have memorized some things. We may have listened to a subject or taught a subject. It can never be exhausted. I don't care how great a commentary is, how great a translation is. I don't care how great a book is. None of these things are exhaustible because God is eternal and he is absolute. And the very fact that we can even speak about knowing God as the creator of the universe it, it almost stuns me as the words come out of my lips. This journey is going to raise your praise. It will encourage your worship. It will inform your worship. It will empower your prayer life. It will water the seeds of your calling and your mandate, your individual um, assignments that God has given you while you're in this life. It will encourage you to trust God every step of the way, no matter how much pain or struggle you may be dealing with at any given moment. Because when we see the bigness of God, everything we're looking at, no matter how tragic and heart-wrenching and heartbreaking, when we consider the magnitude of God or the greatness of God, the bigness of God, my Lord, it is going to enhance every aspect of our spiritual walk. And so we're going to trust God with this. So let's pray. And this is going to be meditative. It is, is going to be contemplative. In other words, we'll take our time to really think about, we're gonna notice, uh, to pay attention to key words, to very, very key words, and we're gonna grow. And each lesson, each, each lesson will be a lesson in and of itself. And you'll have a, a, a verse, a key verse as I usually do, to meditate upon, to look at uh, throughout the week or, or a few verses of scripture or a chapter. Uh, if you miss any verses that we're dealing with, if I happen to talk fast or speak fast, we will, you can you know, ask at the end of the session and I'll try to give that to you. If you do have questions, please limit your questions to the subject at hand, not something that has nothing to do with what we're speaking about, with what we're talking about, with what our su subject matter is covering. All right, let's pray. God, 
we want to thank you and we want to praise you. We want to lift you up. We will acknowledge your presence right now. We acknowledge your presence. Whether we can sense your presence or not at this moment, we thank you that you are very present help in the time of trouble. Oh God, at the contemplation of thy majesty, at the contemplation of thy splendor, language becomes very limited. And so Father, God, Yahuwah, Yahweh, Jehovah, Lord, I pray as the Psalmist David prayed, O oh Lord, open thou my lips and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. I declare as the Psalmist David did for all of us, my soul, wait thou only upon God for my expectation, my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength and my refuge is from God. Wait upon God or trust in God at all times. Pour out your heart before him, you people. For God is a refuge for us, Selah. God, I ask that you would allow me to experience the moment of the teacher. Let it not come from me, but through me. To wit, at the end of this exercise, doing, during the course of this sacred enterprise, your people may be challenged and charged, change and encourage. The seeds of our future shall be watered. I pray that you would tailor the text, the scriptures, to fit each and every one of us where we are individually and specifically in every aspect of our lives. We invoke the presence of the spirit of truth that you would communicate your intelligence, oh God, to help us and to reveal the deep truths of the hour in which we live in these most desperate times, but yea, glorious times, God, because it is in the darkest times that you shine the brightest and, and that your church rises to be what you've called us to be, a city that is set upon a hill who will show forth its light, her light, and that our fruit shall not fade away, but we shall bear fruit in season and even out of season we shall declare the fruit of our lips that is giving thanks unto you. Confirm your word tonight, O God. Heal those that need healing and deliverance in their bodies, guidance, and directions, and hope and help. Grant it to be so, God. If you would do these things, I promise not to take any credit for it. But we shall go down from this Zion, giving you praise and glory, for it is due unto your name in the matchless name of the one that by whose stripes we are healed. We say amen and amen. All right, we're calling tonight's class for the moments that we have left. Uh, tonight's class, now our major subject is knowing God. And we'll have sub categories or subtopics that we'll name, but tonight's class is knowing God foundations knowing God foundation. So knowing God dash foundations. And we wanna just look at a few verses of scripture uh, tonight and get us where we want to go or where we're going. I'm not sure what that meant, but hey man, you get my point. All right, now, the very idea of knowing God, you wanna underline that word knowing because it means to be acquainted with, it means to become familiar with, more than familiar with, it means to have a relationship with. So when we speak of knowing God, we're talking about knowing God as the creator of the universe, a faith relationship. Relationship now. Remember what, we deal, what we're talking about is not just religion. We are talking about religion, because religion is what we do, it's what we do. But relationship and spirituality 
is what gives substance to what we're doing. So a faith, faith relationship, a trust relationship, a love relationship with God involves our mind, it involves our heart, it involves our will. And I always like to add that knowing God or teaching is not just talking about God, but also experiencing God. And this is where my challenge comes from. This is where I can never um, be well adjusted to where I am because where I am does not satisfy me because there's always more. So we believe by faith, but we know by experience. There's one thing to talk about the peace of God, the miracle working power of God, the unmerited favor of God. It's one thing to talk about the God who can make a way where there is no way. The God who still works the miraculous, the God who can heal someone from diabetes and cancer, the one who can give uh, direction and guidance in unsolvable situations, the one, the one who can make the soul whole, the one who is the God of peace and the God of righteousness, the God of justice. And of course, the list goes on. It's one thing to talk about that, to preach about it, to teach about it. And it's another thing to experience it. Why is that? Because truth divorced from experience will always remain in the realm of doubt. That's why part of my praying is a big prayer. Lord, let the scriptures happen to us. Let the teaching be an event more than just a talk or a lecture or a lesson, but let it be an event that we experience. Because when you experience God, when you have a, con a confrontation, a direct personal confrontation with the most high God, it gives you a new purpose, a new reason for leaving, living, a new reason for living, a new reason for leaving. Well, we could say a new reason for leaving the old and coming into the new, but we're not gonna leave yet but a new reason for living. When we have a, a confrontation, an experience with God, uh, theology means God talk, but that God talk must lead us somewhere. It must lead us into deeper levels of trust, but we have a reason to trust God. God gives us reason and gives us experience. And so um, truth divorced from experience will always remain in the realm of doubt. I want to say that again. Truth divorced from experience, truth apart from experience, will always remain in the realm of doubt. Amen. So, and that's what a testimony is. Something happened to you. And as a result of something happening to you, God bringing you through something, God doing something in you and for you, you now have a testimony. And a testimony has a telling effect because you've been through a test, you passed the test by applying what you have learned from the things of God. Remember a test, when we say God is testing us or we're going through a test, it is not a time when we're really learning something new it is a time where we apply what we've already learned. You can't take a test unless you've learned something. But let me tell you something, passing that test is, is applying what you have learned and God giving you an experience, a reality where the Lord becomes real. And it, can I give you a word that's, that's really not a word, but realer, more real. Well, that's what, that's what growth is all about. This is the beginning of the new year. We're in the first month, almost, almost in the halfway mark, but always a good verse that's very powerful that can encourage us more than anything else is Philippians chapter one and verse six. Paul tells the Philippian church being, being confident, that word confidence meaning come to a full persuasion. Now, listen to me. It's not up to the preacher. Listen to me carefully, please. 
It is not up to the preacher or the teacher or the evangelist or the pastor to convince you, to persuade you, uh, to bring you to a place of being fully confident. Now, the preacher, the human vessel, can, can water, remember, water can plant seeds of confidence, can water the confidence that God gives you. But it is the job of the Holy Spirit to work a miracle between the voice of the communicator and the ears of the ones who are listening. And this is why Jesus said, who has ears to hear, let them hear. Why? Because we could hear and still miss the message. And that's why we need the Holy Ghost. This is why we need the Holy Spirit. We could, we could hear the words, but miss the message. And Paul said it to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He said, he said, when I came to you, Corinthians, I'm paraphrasing now, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And then this is what he said, one of the most profound, I pray this, man, oh my goodness, I could park in that verse forever. My speech and my preaching was not with, here's the language, here's the Greek language, was not with mere enticing words. In other words, flowery speech used to impress rather than express the heart and the will and the mind of God. My speech and my preaching was not with mere enticing words. Now, he, we're not saying that Paul wasn't eloquent because he sat at the feet of Gamaliel. He was one of the most educated men of his time. He studied the law seven hours a day with a half hour off for lunch. He, 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 he studied constantly. And he was a Pharisee. So he had to study the law. I mean, just constantly, every detail of it. He had to know it verbatim. So he's not saying that eloquence is wrong, but he's saying that if I don't come with something other than eloquence, something other than flowery speech, my preaching to you is not going to affect any kind of change. My, my preaching is not going to come with, with any kind of, any kind of change. Let me give you that verse again. Uh, 1 Corinthians, I quoted two verses. Philippians chapter one and verse six. And then 1 Corinthians chapter two, beginning with verse four. Or actually, to be honest with you, 1 Corinthians chapter two, you ought to begin from the first verse. Because, because really the whole chapter is dealing with knowing God from, well, let me just go there. Let me go there. This is class, so I'm not going to rush through this. And we'll take our time. So someone just put in the chat, can we give that verse? All right. First Corinthians chapter two. And let me tell you again, please, if you have a new King James version, a King James and a new King James. We'll use other translations, but I want to use the King James and the New King James for the word studies that I'll do. And I like to use the base of King James and New King James for the word studies because usually those translations, uh, other translations will come from um, the authorized version. So 1 Corinthians chapter 2 uh, and verse 1, that's the scripture that we, that I just quoted. And I want to be careful with doing that. So I want to go there proper. And I'm going to try to repeat the reference so you can get it. That's what class is all about, teaching. So I don't want you to miss anything. Um, there's always more information than time. And we would rather catch the information rather than overload. We would rather catch key verses and key statements rather than overload with a lot of information. So 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. This is King James now, King James. Get yourself a King James Bible and get yourself a new King James. We'll use NIV, we'll use the ESV, we'll use the NLT and other translations, but we'll begin with that. Verse 1, and I, brethren, when I came to you, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, and I, 
brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech, there's the language, or of wisdom, the language is flowery speech or flowery words, flowery words. You know, I'm using, you know, flowery words just to make an impression rather than having on my mind to bring about the expression of what God wants to get across to his people. So not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything, verse two, among you save Jesus Christ or accept Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's the bottom line of this whole matter. Can I tell you that that's what unites us? Because we're going to deal with issues of diversity because God is a God of diversity. Different elements, different cultures, different backgrounds, different genders, different ages, different uh, races, different nations, um, different influences. And yet God speaks one language and knows how to interpret to each of the inhabitants of the earth exactly what we need to hear, how we need to hear it, and when we need to hear it, and who we need to hear it from. The amazing thing to me is that every person on the planet Earth, out of the billions of people that exist on the planet, God has given each one a different fingerprint. Oh my, this, listen, there's the contemplation of God right now. One person said, at the contemplation of God's majesty, all eloquence becomes dumb. I don't know about you, but I'm glad for the Holy Ghost because he's called to be our teacher. What does that mean? Instructor, guide, guard, coach. He is our God, guide, guard, coach, trainer, intercessor, lawyer, advocate, one who pleads our case and pleads our cause, one who stands in the gap for us. Thank God for pastors and leaders and friends and feeders who know how to pray. But thank God that even the Holy Ghost living in us right now, the spirit of the Lord living in us, intercedes for us. That means one who prays according to our specific need. Yes, yes, sir. That's why, listen, when you are talking to God, don't you ever get, I mean, there is an intimidation of, of expressing the details we need to express because none of us as human beings know the exact detail of what we should pray for for anyone, including ourselves. Why? Because we do not know all of the intricate details of the past, present, and future, and yet God does. And God chose to come down, condescend, to our degree and relate to us. I, makes me want to stop and say, Father, I thank you. And he knows my language. Not only does he speak each of our languages, but he knows what we're trying to say at any given moment. And you ought to thank God right now, not tomorrow, right now, not a minute from now. Thank him right now that God knows your heart. He knows your language. He knows what you're trying to say. He knows what you can't even form with speech, what you think about. That's what Ephesians chapter three, verse 20 and 21 says. He is able to do above and beyond all that we ask, verbalize, or even think or dream or imagine far beyond our ability or our imagination, not our ability, rather far beyond our wildest imagination. Ephesians 3, verses 20 and 21. Okay, back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 3, listen to what he says. Again, that statement. At the contemplation of his majesty, all eloquence becomes dumb. And that's why I want to deal with Psalms when we're talking about, when we're speaking of knowing God. Because when we, when we, when we contemplate, this is going to be meditative and contemplating. It will give rise to prayer. It will give rise to praise. It will give rise to trust, to submission, to laying down our burdens, knowing that God can handle everything. Remember, this is foundation. So I know I'm going from here to there, but this is okay because I'm exhorting you right now about the journey that we're about to embark upon. Ooh, good God from Zion. I'm so glad nothing takes him by surprise. 
I'm jumping ahead, but it's okay. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, my speech, no, verse 3 of 1 Corinthians 2, King James, and, and verse 3, and I was with you with weakness. Hear the humility of the apostle Paul and fear and in much trembling. You know why? I'm, I'm, like, I'm like that man. Because let me tell you something, when I'm dealing with the biblical text, sometimes you can't see it, I'm always nervous. My heart is always fluttering like the wings of a butterfly. My knees are trembling when I'm dealing with the sacred word of God because we're dealing with people's lies. We're dealing with ramification, ramifications of eternal significance. That your purpose, your significance, your importance, who you are, who you, you were created to be did not begin in time. It began in eternity. Mm. So I tremble. I'm trembling. I pray, God, let no word come from my lips that is contrary to your truth. That's why sometimes all I can say is like David said in Psalm 51 and 15, oh, Lord, you open my lips and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. And part of that praise is what I ought to say, what I should say, how I should say it. That's why I'm never, and that's why Paul said, listen, I, I'm eloquent. I sat at the feet of Gamaliel. I know how to quote scripture from beginning to end and from the end to the beginning. But when it comes to communicating the mind of God, I cannot read God's mind. God must reveal his mind. There's your foundation of knowing God. We know God because God makes himself known. We can only discover what God uncovers. And, and, and this is the beauty of it. We're seeking him. We're, go, we're embarking on the journey. We're hungry to know. But oh God, he invites us. He draws us by his power. Whew. See, that's why you, God is pained when we try to handle things in our own strength. We are limited, but what a benefit, what an advantage, what a privilege that we can bring God, everything to the Lord in prayer. As the hymnist stated, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech, verse 4, 1 Corinthians 2, my speech and my preaching, but was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration. Can somebody say with me, demonstration? Remember I spoke of talking about God is one thing, experiencing God is another. On the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter two, verse one and following, I love the theological layout. When the day of Pentecost, here's your reference, Acts chapter two, verse one and following. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, suddenly, can I give you a word right now? Some of you are going to have some sudden visitations of God. God coming to you suddenly, maybe in your sleep, suddenly while you're walking down the street, suddenly while you're driving or, or, or in your car or having a conversation, suddenly God will come upon you with a thought from the throne. He'll reveal your himself to you. A verse will come alive, an encouragement that you need, and you'll know it's from God. And on the day of Pentecost, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. You know why this subject is important? Because when we're dealing with the subject of knowing God, we need a sound from heaven because there's, there's, there's no way we can know God without a sound coming from heaven, without a voice coming from heaven. Oh, if we're hearing a lot of voices on earth, but those are mere echoes. We need a sound originating from God's holy throne. <laughs> Matthew 4 and 4. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And, and, and they heard a sound from heaven. Suddenly there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. In other words, they saw fire in the room, like a big ball of fire, but then the fire separated and it sat upon each of them. 
and suddenly they were filled with the Holy Ghost and they began to speak in languages that they never learned. So they heard something, number one. They saw something. Num they, they saw the fire. They heard the sound. Number three, they got filled. They experienced something. And then they began to speak. And then the Bible says they began to go out and minister. See, some, nothing will ever happen through you until something happens to you. You know why it's a privilege of having you as students or teaching the word of God to anybody because each one of you are unique. We're talking about a God of diversity. That's what we did last week with, with my session. Part of what I was discussing and part of what the pamphlet was discussing or the booklet was discussing was diversity. That God is a God of diverse, diversity. And it's amazing, this is why we're called a body because each one of you are part of the body and every part of the body is important. And if it's a privilege, it's a sacred privilege. I tremble because it means that the possibility is that God may use me to water the seeds of your future. In the midst of all this mess, God will use you to rearrange things and make a blessing come out of a mess. Isn't that amazing that God could use your sorrow? Only God could do that. That God could use your heartache and heartbreak. That God could use the confusion that you may be in the middle of. You better listen to me because one of the greatest things that you will learn about God is God is always there and in the beginning. It's the biggest statement of the Bible. Genesis chapter one, verse one, the first four verses. In the beginning, God. What does that tell you, sister? What does that tell you, brother? God is always in the beginning. There would be no beginning without a beginner and God began everything, which means God has to be before the beginning. Be encouraged that nothing takes God by surprise. God does not need a plan B in your life, ministers. God does not need a plan B in your life, sons and daughters. Why? Because nothing takes him by surprise. The only reason you would need a plan B is that something caught you off guard. Now you've got to devise another plan. But nothing takes God by surprise. Nothing catches God off guard. Ooh, I feel it in my spirit right now. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith, listen, this is the key, that your faith, look, verse five, no, where are we? Yeah, verse five of 1 Corinthians 2, that your faith, King James, that your faith should not stand. That's the foundation we're talking about. That your, that your faith should not be founded upon. In other words, if all we have is words, but no signature from the most high God, no confirmation, then they are just words. We need more than words. We need more than just another mouth. I tell ministers all the time, listen, <laughs> ministers and preachers come a dime a dozen. You can, you can teach a parrot to preach. But what I, listen, I don't wanna just bring a message. I want to become a message. I'd rather preach on one verse for the rest of my life because God inculcated that verse in my soul. I'd rather testify about one thing in my life because it happened to me. That's how Paul could testify. God met me on the road to Damascus, changed who I was. I was a blasphemer and a murderer, but he changed me. And rather than destroying me in the wrath of God because I was killing his people, he rather picked me up and kissed me with the Holy Ghost, poured out his mercy upon me and then gave me a mandate and a calling to preach was rejected by the people that supported me, that once supported me, and then now I'm sent to minister to the ones I used to persecute. I'm gonna say it again, only God can take a mess and rearrange it and make a blessing come out of a mess. But it was so real to Paul that he said, woe is me if I don't do what God called me to do because it's so real to me. Real tears, hot tears, real brokenness, a real experience so much so that I had to be by myself for a while. 
And then when I came out of that place of isolation, I had to tell somebody about it. Songwriter said, said I wasn't going to tell nobody, but I couldn't keep it to myself. God has been so good to me. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out. Hallelujah. Thank God for saving me. You know that our ancestors who experienced slavery, there had to be something in their DNA, something about knowing God that made them survive the middle passage and not give up all hope. They cry out in, in the midnight hour, past the trees and the stars, when, the, when their families were broken up and separated from one another because of what human beings did to us as a people. Soon and very soon, we were going to see the king. And even if I didn't see my mother and my sister and my daughter and my, my child again in this life, I'd see them one day beyond this beyond this life. So there was always hope. Why? Because God came down to them. Even though the Bible was, was they were, we were forbidden to read the scriptures properly and then had handpicked preachers. I'm saying that because that was a time that we, those of us who are people of color, know to some degree that that was history. That happened. And when you use the biblical text, man, I'm not going to be silent about that. That's painful. And that pain, the, the blood of ancestors and what our people have been through still cries out from the ground. God cares about that. And yet God did not hide his face. He didn't hide himself from us hundreds of years ago. And that same God who revealed himself to our forefathers and raised up people like, like Sojourner Truth and Maddie B. Poole and, and, and Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass and the list goes on. Their focus was God. That's, that was the movers and the shakers. This generation needs a desperate move of God. Not just titles. We need people who know God. That's what old Daniel prophesied years ago. There will come a day when people who do know their God will rise and do exploits in his name. I'm not afraid to pass from the earth, but I don't want to leave until my assignment is over. I need to know this man. I need to know this God. And he said in verse 5 of 1 Corinthians 2, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Take down those verses, 1 Corinthians 2, verses 1 to 5, please. Let it be an, a point of reference and an assignment for you to look at. We're talking about knowing God foundations. And so to know God is to worship him. We're going to deal with the subject of worship. To know God is to worship God, to know God, is to be transformed by God, to be changed. Did you hear me? F Philippians 1, I didn't quote it, I started to quote it, but Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that reflects a pronoun, what very thing, that he, meaning God, which began the good work in you, I wish somebody would say this work that God began me, that God began in me is an inside job. Did you know God is working when you don't feel like he's working? When it looks like nothing is happening, God is working. When it looks like everything is standing still, God is moving. Ooh, ooh, don't you listen? Don't you unpack too early? Huh? Don't you build a monument? Don't you get too comfortable in any particular place because God is still moving. Tell somebody, go on down the road because the Christian life, the spiritual life is a life of progression and advancement. Paul said, I forget those things which are behind. Come on, sister. I forget those things which are behind. Come on, brother. Forget in the Greek doesn't mean amnesia. It doesn't mean I can't remember what has occurred. But listen. I'm assigning unprofitable history to oblivion. I refuse to be a prisoner of unprofitable history. I'm not going to be a prisoner of what the mistakes I made. I'm not going to be a prisoner of what people have done to me or what they think about me. I'm not going to be a prisoner of, of, of what uh, uh, people, who well, I already said that, of any unprofitable history. 
But you know why? Because I got a goal. I got a destination. And the God that I want to come to know, the God that I'm learning about, the God that I serve is not talking about my history. He's talking about my destiny. But the God that we serve is so powerful and so merciful that the word of God, the scriptures are so prophetic. Listen to me, my sister T, that God's word is so prophetic that he'll speak a word right now and it will have a zigzag effect. I call it the Z word, Z. It'll start in the present and go back to your history and heal the broken places and spaces of your history that bring you up to date with a present tense testimony and will give you a glimpse and a taste to whet your appetite about your future, about your destiny, about your purpose for being on earth. So much so, enough, even if it's a fingernail grip, enough for you to realize that your purpose and your possibilities and your potential, potential is worth fighting for today, no matter how drastic things are and no matter how tough things are. Potential is not what you have done. History is what you've done. Potential is what you can do. And we're gonna deal with those words like omnipotent because that's who you are tied with. That's who you're connected to. That's who's living within you. Omni means all, everything, unlimited, omnipotent, all powerful. Potent comes from the word potential, which means one who has all potential, dominant power and unused strength. So your potential is not limited because your potential is connected to and in relationship with the omnipotential God, meaning the God who has all power, unlimited strength, the God who is the most perfect being, the God who is the absolute, absolute plenitude, plenitude of reality. In other words, he is the fullness of being. There's no measuring him. He has no beginning and no end. Who can figure out God except God will pull back the veil and give us a glimpse of his nature and give us a revelation of his works and unveils the power of his name and embraces us, calls us into communion with him, calls us into that intimate fellowship of praise to where praise becomes so intimate, it moves into worship and God begins to reveal himself to you and you can't help yourself because God's presence manifests himself and we become like the, the angels, holy, 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 Lord God almighty. They worship him to the superlative to degree, to the superlative degree that they call that word holiness three times. Holy, he's holy. There's another revelation. There's another insight. There's another understanding. And all of a sudden, those weaknesses and those limitations and those burdens and those pains and strains and stresses, and even when we feel like God has let us down, all of a sudden, they begin to fade away. And God brings us from one place to another. Don't you unpack too early, because God is moving on. Go on down the road. Progression. A thousand miles cannot be reached without first taking one step. And the God who began it is continuing it right now and will finish it. Aren't you glad that he is the author and the finisher of our faith? So knowing God is experiencing God, the experience of his presence and his power, being transformed by him. And when we meet together next week, we're going to talk about knowing God as the creator. We're going to talk about knowing God as the sustainer. And we're going to talk about knowing God as the God who is achieving his purpose. Even though it seems like evil is ruling and, and winning the day, no, it's not. No, it's not. And God, did you know that God will prove himself to us? Somebody said, well, God don't have to prove himself to us. Let me tell you something. When God calls us into praise and worship, that's why I want to deal with the Psalms. Because many of the Psalms says, we praise the Lord for he is good for his mercy endures forever. And his mercy has to do with his loving kindness has said in uh, Hebrew, it means his unfailing love, but not just what God does. Ooh, I'm, I'm feeling love of the father right now and I need it. Not just what God does, 
But listen to me, beautiful sister. Listen to me, beautiful brother. But what God longs to do, we're not going to believe the devil's lie and say, God ain't going to hear you because of those mistakes you made, because of what somebody said to you. No, nah, no, nah, nah. no. The devil is a liar. He said, come on to me. Come on to me, all you who are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Come boldly to the throne of grace. Amen. All right. I will try to maintain the blueprint flow. So let me give you, let me give you, we're gonna have to continue with foundations um, next week, but that's okay. Cause you know, God um, meets us where we are. So we'll call it foundations and we'll put another title to it so we can differentiate between each lesson. But amen, we'll, we'll, we'll stop there. So I gave you the verses, the key verses, uh, some, of the, some of the verses that I reference, and it's good to look at those because then when you read them again, the Holy Spirit will bring things back to your mind uh, that were stated. And you know, God is so loving that maybe one statement, one word, one phrase was for one purpose. And in God's heart and mind, you're worth it. Sometimes we can't figure out why we're saying what we're saying or why we don't move past a certain point because sometimes the spirit of God wants to emphasize something for our own encouragement. And can I tell you something? God does correct us and his truth does correct and cuts, but never condemnation, always encouragement. Did you hear me? Always, not sometimes, always. A word from God is not designed to beat you down and make you feel guilty and make you feel hopeless and helpless. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Always to encourage you, to edify you and to lift you up so that you can have a reason to wake up tomorrow morning and go on no matter what the issues of life have been. So remember these verses, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 to 5, and then we read, uh, quoted Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, as we were talking about that theological out, outlay of hearing something, seeing something, and then experiencing something, and then doing something. And that's Acts chapter, one, uh, Acts chapter 2, and verses 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, round about 6. So those first, first few verses when you read them, you'll remember that. And um, those verses this is what we're going to deal with. But next week, uh, I want to deal with the fact that um, knowing God is a very key element in the scriptures, uh, both in the Old and New Testament. We're going, to, we're going to talk about the importance of knowing God. So we'll call that the importance of knowing God foundations also. We're going to deal with even people in the book of Acts where Paul saw they had a statue or they had a big sign that said to the unknown God. So they were trying to worship a deity that, that they didn't know. And many were actually creating the deity, the work of their own hands, and then bowing down and worship what they created. That's not worship. So we'll end on a positive note. First Corinthians chapter two and verse five. Well, for, verses four and five, and my speech and my preaching, Paul says, what not, was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration and expression. Demonstration means it's made real in your sight and in your side. You experience it, but in demonstration of the spirit and your and power and of power, verse five, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men but in the power of God. That's my prayer for us tonight, that God, the foundation of knowing you, that the truth of your word will come from you, will come from the inspiration and the insight of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And Lord, we wanna, we wanna submit and surrender ourselves and say, Holy Spirit of God, please become our teacher. Teach us to say amen to your yes. For every promise that you give is a yes. Lord, I pray that you would so minister to us that what you communicate 
to us through your word will become our foundation for knowing you, that your word is our foundation, that the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. Lord, for your company and your community, your sons and daughters, your people, your church right now, I pray that you would minister to them your healing power. If you're having an issue in your body, just put your hand, just touch your body as a point of contact. I ask God now to touch you where the pain is, where you need healing and deliverance from that chronic affliction or that disease or that sickness. God, touch you now in the name of Jesus and bring healing to your body. Lift it off of them now, God, I ask you. Whether it's pain or some other issue, heal now whether it's the issues in the emotions in our psychology, touch now and bring peace, work a miracle, do it in their hearts and souls. But we need guidance and direction. Thank you for granting us guidance and direction and comfort of the soul. Thank you for it, Lord. We lay down our burdens and our concerns, our worries and our frets as you've uh, told us to do in your word. We lift our, we take our, we get, give you our burdens and we receive your answers. We want to thank you, Lord, that as we leave this platform, we do not leave your presence because you've given us a promise to be with us always, even until the end of the age, right on into eternity. I claim the promises of Psalm 91 for each and every one of us that you will protect our person and our property from trouble, harm, and danger, seen and unseen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and super rule upon you, the people of God. May it abide henceforth now and forevermore. We say amen and amen.